Are you ready for a hot mess part three? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, I want to start today uh, by having you stand one last time. One last time, because I'm going to read a short passage, and, I, and it's one of these passages that is familiar to us, and a lot of times something that's familiar, we can get, uh, uh, we can fail to fully appreciate something that's very familiar to us. I don't know if you've ever had that happen, right? You, you, you appreciated her when you were dating, but now she's familiar, and you don't, right? You appreciated him. No? Some of you guys are like, don't even go there. All right. We'll do relationship sermons in February, so don't worry. Um, but it's a familiar passage, but it's, it's so dense, it's so packed uh, with, with, with content that I think we sometimes brush over it because we're familiar with it. And here's what it says. It says this. It says, we know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth, right up to the present time. In other words, the whole creation is a hot mess. The whole creation is struggling. Uh, the environment is struggling. Relationships between human beings is struggling. Politics, it, it, you know, the economy. All creation groans. All creation struggles with the pains as of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only that, it says, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, Grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. In other words, not only does the creation groan, but even as believers in our current state, in our current mortal body, in, in the tent made of flesh, as the scripture calls it, we struggle. We experience pain. We experience pressure. We experience sin and suffering and sorrow. So even we, followers of Jesus, experience pain. We groan inwardly. But that's not all we know. In verse 28, the Apostle Paul says this. It says, and we know that all things, all things, what kind of things? Help me now. What, what about good things? What about bad things? What about things we don't want to talk about? What about things we're ashamed of? What about suffering? What about sin? All things, he said, work together. For good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. All things work together for good. Will you help me out one last time? Turn to the person next to you and tell them the name of my message and tell them there's a mission in your mess. There's a mission in your mess. And you can grab a seat. I've got, a little, I've got a, little, a little cold this morning, but God says all things work together. So I think he's going to use my voice to make me sound more like T.D. Jakes, and all things will work <clears throat> together for his good. <laughs> Maybe not, but we'll see. Um, last, uh, two weeks ago, we looked at the life of Job, right? Job was a man, righteous man, suffered, all this affliction came upon him, but God met him in the mess, right? We learned that when you press in instead of pull away, God will meet you right in the midst of your mess. That's a powerful message, right? Next, uh, last week, we looked at the life of the Samaritan woman. We explored this conversation between Jesus and the Samaritan woman, and we learned that not only will God meet you in your mess, but he'll be the Messiah of your mess. In other words, he'll pull you out of that mess, right? He met her at the very point of, of her pain, at the very point of her struggle, and he said, I'm gonna deliver you from this problem. I'll be the Messiah in your mess. This week, we're taking this thing one step further because not only does God wanna meet you in your mess, not only does God wanna deliver you out of your mess, he actually wants to use your mess to help you fulfill your mission. He wants to take your problems and give them a purpose. He wants to take the stuff that you do not want in your life, the shame and the sin and the hurt and the grief and the loss and the sorrow, and he wants to take that and not just deliver you out of it. He wants to actually use that. He said all things work together for the good of those who love God. So he wants to take that and point you to your mission. Now, 
Today, I want to look at the, the, the life of a man who was a complete hot mess. We don't know his name. We don't know his, his, his family background. We don't know anything about his politics. We don't know anything about anything about this man except for his problem. This man is actually identified to us by his problem. It's in, uh, the story is in Acts chapter 3, and it says this. It says, now a man who was lame from birth. This man's problem was so great that he was defined by it. He was defined by his deficiency. In the scripture, we learn by, about him from his problem. We learn that, that this, is the, this is the number one thing about this man. He was lame from birth. It wasn't that there was once a man who was very intelligent and accomplished who also happened to be lame. He had, he had a congenital defect from the time he was born in his feet and his ankles, and that defined him. A lot of times, when we allow our problems to, to, to develop, to grow so much, and we focus on them, we actually identify with our issues. We start to see ourselves through the prism of our problems. We start to identify ourselves through the abuse that we experienced or the anxiety that we're experiencing. We start to see ourselves uh, through the lens of the divorce that we went through or the disease that we've been diagnosed with. We can, we can, if we're not careful, like this man, become defined by the deficiency, defined by the problem, right? He was a man, that it says, who was lame from birth. Uh, and, and he was being carried, it said, to the temple gate called Beautiful. So he's being carried to the, to the temple, uh, so, uh, the Solomon's temple, where he was put every day to beg from those going into the temple courts. This was his life. From the time he was born, imagine this. We learn later on that he, this man was already over 40 years old. So life expectancy of an Israelite male in the first century was about 40. This guy was already at the twilight at the end of his life, and this had been his life, it said, from birth. So when his mother gave birth to him, she saw this beautiful little baby, but she noticed that his legs appeared to be a little more bowed than the other kids. And she prayed that, that he would grow out of it, but he didn't. And so when the other little kids began to, to sort of crawl across the floor, this little boy would just sit there and stare off at, at the other kids. When the other kids started cruising across the furniture in the home, he just watched from where he sat. When the other kids got up and started walking, he couldn't get up and walk. By the time he was a teenager, kids were running around doing the things they do. And this man, this young man could do nothing. He just was stuck in his problem. This is the situation that he was in. And now it's the twilight of his life. His whole life has gone by. And all he has been able to do is sit at the temple gate and beg. His whole life has been in reliance on the kindness of other people. If you asked him, hey man, what's your purpose? He would laugh at you. I don't have a purpose. I, this, is just, this is my life. I just try to survive. I don't have a mission. I'm just a mess. I'm just sitting here trying to get by. That's my mission, to live one more day. That was the, the, the nature of his life from the time that he was born until the present time. But, but, here's the situation in the scripture. What we're going to learn is that where you see a problem, God sees potential. Where you look at your life and can see nothing but difficulty, nothing but problems, God will look at those problems and go, I see potential to do something with that problem that will not only lead you to your mission, but it will transform the lives of the people around you. Uh, my son, Lincoln, is three and a half. He's, uh, no, Augustine's three and a half. There's so many, man. Uh, uh, <laughs> Lincoln is seven, um, I, I think, uh, roughly. And um, He's really creative. Like, he just comes up with stuff. He gets it from his mom. He's like, she's creative. He just comes up with stuff. And, and you know, you look at the stuff he makes up, and you go, man, where, where does that come? How do you come up with this? So the other day, he showed me one of his art pieces of artwork. And I was like, and I, and I literally stopped. I go, Lincoln, where do you, where do you, how do you think of this stuff? Because I could never do that. And he says to me, he says, Dad, when I see something, I see it in two ways. And I said, oh, really? How's that? He said, I'll give you an example. He said, when I see a bottle cap, he said, I see a bottle cap, but I also see a shield for a small warrior. And I was like, okay, I can see that now that you said that, but I would never have seen that. God sees us 
in two ways. He sees what we are, and he sees what he wants to turn us into. He sees what we are in our current state, but that's not what he looks at. We look at ourselves through the prism of our problem. He looks at us through the prism of our potential. And he says, I'm going to take the bottle cap of your life. I'm going to take the pain and the struggle and the issue and the challenges in your life. And I'm going to convert them into something. Because what I do is I work all things together. That passage, if you look at it in the Greek, work together is the word synergy. Some of you know, have used that word. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a you know, it's, it's a popular word in, in corporate speak and all that. Synergy means that this, 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 all the stuff comes together and works together. He says, I'm going to synergize your life. I'm going to take not only the good stuff and the gifts and the strengths, but I'm going to take the pain, the problem, and the pressure, and I'm going to put it all together, and I'm going to work it for your good. I'm going to work it for your good. So, where you see a problem, he sees uh, potential. Let me go back to one more, one more point in that Romans uh, passage that we read at the top. Do you remember the kind of pain he described? Do you remember how he described it? He said it's the pain as of childbirth. It's, chi- it's childbirth-like pain. Two things he's communicating there. First of all, childbirth pain. He didn't say it's like pain like a paper cut. All right. He said it's pain like childbirth. What he's saying is it's acute pain. It's severe pain. It's, it's, it's strong pain. It's powerful pain. It's real pain, right? It's, 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 it's powerful. I, and this is why childbirth God gave to women, because he knew that men would, if he gave it to men, species would be extinct years, years, years ago. Like, I can't even suffer the pain of a common cold very well, I'm telling you. Like, I can't lift my hand to get the tissue. I'm like, I'm pitiful when it comes to pain. But God says, it's, it's pain like childbirth. In other words, the pain that you're experiencing, he's not diminishing the reality of that pain. He's saying, it's real. The abuse that you've experienced or the, or the, or the pressure that you've experienced or the anxiety that you're feeling or the depression that you're in, that pain is real and it's strong pain. It hurts. But there's another reason that he uses the pain of childbirth because that pain has a purpose that pain results in something beautiful the pain of childbirth becomes a, a, a beautiful baby something precious right so it's not just pain it's not just arbitrary random pain that you're experiencing it's pain that has a purpose and when you have when you're experiencing pain and you know there's a purpose behind it your endurance goes up right because in fact, I remember when we had, uh, again, one of our children afterwards, my wife, like the day after, she had been through this incredible, difficult hours and hours of excruciating labor. And the next day, we're in the hospital. And we're sort of sitting there, and she's holding the baby. And she turns to me and she goes, I think I could have one more. <laughs> the day after, she was screaming in pain, right? Because after you've experienced the result, the purpose, the pain is not worthy to compare to the glory that she experienced afterwards, right? So she said, there's, there's, there's pain, but it's pain with a purpose. And in this situation, this man could only see his pain, but God saw his potential. And, and, and here's what happened. It says, when this man saw Peter and John about to enter the temple, so God sends two of Jesus' closest disciples to go walk past this guy on this particular day. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. Now, here's what's interesting. This guy needed money, but there's stuff that he needed way more than money. He needed healing. He needed redemption. He needed a lot of stuff more than he needed money. But, but sometimes when we suffer with a problem for a really, really long time, we stop looking for the solution. We just settle for survival. We just say, all right, I just need to get by one more day. I just need to get through one more day. I'm not even trying to get better. I'm just trying to get by. I, don't, I, I can't get rid of that, that problem in my life, so I'm just going to have to manage it. I, I can't get rid of that sin in my life, so maybe I'll just have to hide it. I, don't, I, I can't get rid of the problem or the attitude that I'm experiencing, so I guess I'm just going to have to live with it. I'm just going to have to get by. That's where this man was. He had suffered for so long and given up all hope. 
So now he's just saying, all right, I'll just, I'll just take some money because that's, I mean, that's all I can expect. He saw Peter and John about to enter. He asked them for money. Peter looked straight at him, as did John. Now, this was a rare experience because a lot of people, when they saw this man, they do like we do when we pull up to the red light and somebody comes and they've got their sign by our window, you know, and you do that thing where you act like you don't even see him. I don't have peripheral vision. I'm just looking straight ahead. Radio, you know what I mean? But, but Peter didn't, because you don't want to look at the problem. Peter says, look, I see a person here. I don't see just a problem. I see a person. He had compassion. This guy had been dehumanized his whole life. So dehumanized that not only did people not look at him, but he didn't look at them. How do we know? Because Peter says, look at me. Look at us, he said. So the man gave them his attention, expecting to get something from them. Then Peter said, silver or gold I do not have. He shouldn't have hit up. Jesus' disciples for money because they had given up their fishing business a long time ago. Uh, I don't have any money, but what I do have, I'm going to give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. It says, taking the man by the right hand, he helped him up. And instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet. He began to walk. Then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. I mean, that is a good story right there. This man who had been suffering all his life meets a man who says, I'm going to give you something that you don't even know you need. Get up and walk. I'm going to pull you out of your problem. And this man who had never experienced the weight of his own body underneath his feet, he'd never felt the ground beneath his feet. He'd never had that experience of being able to spring up and down on his toes. Suddenly is filled with strength and and he just comes skipping and dancing and praising God into the temple. And when we read this, we celebrate with this guy because we go, man, God is a healer. God is a deliverer. God brought this man out of all of his problems, right? And, And if you've ever experienced God bringing you out of something you know what that feels like if you've been there you go man thank you God you feel gratitude you feel joy you feel ecstatic by what God is doing in your life right so this is a good story we could close this story right here but that's not the end of the story because God doesn't want to only meet you in your mess he doesn't want to only deliver you out of your mess he wants to take you from deliverance to destiny. He wants to take you from where you're at right now and pull you out and not just pull you out. He wants to take the pain that you're experiencing and do something with it. He doesn't want to waste 40 years of paralysis. He wants to do something with it. He wants to take you from deliverance to destiny. Last week, we looked at the Samaritan woman, you remember, and, and, we, and God met her in her mess. They're at a well. The irony is, you know, Jesus pretends to be thirsty so that he can point out her spiritual thirst, remember? And, and, and so he comes to her and he says two things to her. He says, the first thing is, if you drink from the water that I give you, you will never thirst again. In other words, I'm going to quench your thirst. I am going to deliver you from your thirst because you keep trying to quench your thirst with stuff that makes you more thirsty, right? You keep trying to fill your life with in her case, man after man after man after man, right? Because she wanted love and she wanted to be acknowledged and she, want, she wanted to feel valued. And so she kept trying to quench her thirst with all these men and all these relationships and it wasn't working. And so Jesus said, I'm gonna quench your thirst. If you drink from the water that I give, I'll quench your thirst. But then he didn't stop there because he said, not only will I quench your thirst, but the water that I give you will become in you a spring of living water bubbling out of you. So not only will I quench your thirst, I'm not going to just deliver you. I'm also going to turn you into your destiny. I'm going to let that water flow. You're going to become a thirst quencher as a result of your pain. Because remember what she said to the people that she went and talked to. Here was her sermon. She went to them and said, I met a man who told me everything I've ever done. Everything I've ever done, meaning Every sin I've committed, all the shame in my life, which you know about because it's a small town, right? And all of you know the shame I'm talking about. 
And God has, Jesus has told me about all of that. In other words, she used her shame as her story to bring salvation to the people that she was meeting, right? So he didn't just deliver her, he pointed her to her destiny. The mess of her life, think about this, the mess of her life, this sort of recurring desire to fill her, her life with meaning through sex and relationships and whatever, that became the, the, the mechanism for her message. That became the material that she used to bring people to Jesus. Do you understand what I'm saying? He, he took the problem and used the problem for a purpose. They would not have been impressed by her story if she had been like this hyper-righteous woman who just said, I'm just more righteous, I'm still righteous, right? He used the mess of her story to bring this message, right? That's what Jesus does. That's what Jesus does with this guy. He says this, after the man is up jumping around, praising God, hallelujah, he's healed. When all of the people saw him walking and praising God, they what? They recognized him. You know why they recognized him? Because he had been sitting there for 40 years. They walked by him day after day after day after day. Praising God as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened. You see, if they didn't know about his problem, they would not be so impressed by this solution. They would not be so impressed by him. They would say, there's a weird dude dancing in the temple. That's what they would say, right? If they didn't know about his problem. There's a guy doing the electric slide across the synagogue and what, you know, so, but they knew about his problem. So now they're interested in the solution. And Peter, I love Peter. He sees this. When Peter saw this, he said to them, so he starts preaching. Peter's a preacher. And whenever a preacher gets a crowd, they just start preaching. They just start, they can't help themselves. And so he starts preaching and he goes, fellow Israelites, why does this surprise you? Why do you stare at us as if by your own power or godliness we had, made you, uh, we had made this man walk? And then he starts preaching and he starts telling them the story about how uh, uh, Jesus came and God glorified him. And, 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 and he's preaching and he says, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of our fathers has glorified his servant Jesus. And so he just preaches this sermon, right? Because now he's got a prop. He's got a prop. He's got a man who's dancing who was lame. And so he says, see? This is the God I'm talking about. The God who can do this for this man can do this for you, right? And what happened? What was the result? The scripture says, many who heard the message believed. So the number of men who believed grew to be about 5,000. So here's what's interesting. Why did, why did 5,000 people come to be followers of Jesus on that day? It was not Peter's oratorical skill, I can tell you. You can read Acts chapter 3. You can read his sermon. It's not that, it's not that good, actually. It's not, it's not that impressive of a sermon. I mean, Peter can preach, but this sermon's really short. doesn't look like he put a... There are no points. There are no three points. I mean, like, there's, there's no power slide. There's no, nothing, right? He preaches, and people come. Why did they come? Right? Because they had seen a man with a problem. This man's problem became the very purpose for his life. 5,000 people came to Jesus as a result of a man sitting there for 40 years with a problem. Do you understand? God used his problem to point him to his purpose. Here's the question. What's the problem in your life that God wants to use? What's the mess in your life that God wants to use? What's the pain in your life that you would rather get out of your life, that you would rather forget about? Because it's one thing to be delivered. It's another thing to achieve the destiny that God has for you. And you cannot do that if, if you stop at deliverance. God will deliver you for free. No problem. He'll deliver you. But what he really wants to do is deliver you for a purpose. He wants to deliver you so that he can take the mess of your life Whatever it is, the pain, the doubt, the fear, the shame, the anxiety, the, the, the suffering, and he can use it for his purpose. He wants to take the 40 years and bring you to his purpose for your life. For me, some of the biggest 
challenges as a kid that I had in my life were fear and doubt. As a kid, those were my main, my main problems in life. I was a fearful child, and I just was racked with doubt. And now God has used that to turn me into a person who encourages faith. He took my problems, and he pointed it to my purpose. I'm not getting emotional. I'm not getting emotional. It's just a cold. <clears throat> he, he, he takes whatever you've got, whatever your pain is, whatever your struggle is, and if you'll give it to him, he'll convert it. That's what it means when it says all things. All things. Because here's the final goal. Here's what he wants to do. He wants to turn your mess into a masterpiece. That's what the scripture teaches. He wants to turn your mess into a masterpiece. My wife and I do a date night uh, every, every week. And um, we usually spend all of our money on babysitters. So then we're looking for cheap dates, you know, to go to. Because sometimes the point of a date is just to be away from your children. I love my children, but sometimes silence is the goal, you know. And so we go on these dates. And one night we went to the Kemper uh, Art Museum over on Washington University on the campus. And they had all these wonderful works of art there, beautiful, different kinds of works of art. But there was one that struck me in particular. And it was this huge sculpture of, uh, of a horse. And it was colorful and it was beautiful and it was very tall. It was like seven feet tall. It was like this big majestic pick, uh, you know, sculpture. And I'm looking at it across the, the gallery and it was amazing, right? Just on its own. But the closer I got to it, I realized that the, the, the creator, the, the, the artist, had not used traditional materials. What he had done is he had gone out onto the street and he had found trash, stuff that other people threw away. And he found like, you know, old newspapers and, and wrappers from food and, and like um, uh, grocery bags and, and broken dolls and, and cigarette butts and liquor bottles and it just all this trash, shattered glass. And he took all this and he pieced it together. He worked it together into this beautiful work of art. And I'm looking at it and I'm going, man, there's a, there's a spiritual message here. There's a powerful spiritual message because God wants to take the mess and convert it into a masterpiece. All of the stuff, all of the stuff that you've got, he wants to turn it into a masterpiece. So what does that mean? That means that the sin in your life, the anxiety, he wants to use that. When he says all things, see the Greek word? <laughs> is panta, which is like the broadest Greek word you can use. All things, it means literally everything. Everything that you can imagine. The abortion, the depression, the miscarriage, the loss, the anxiety, the fear, the debt, the failure. Everything that you've experienced in life he wants to use it. He wants to use it for his purpose. He wants to convert it into something beautiful. If we hide it from him, he can't use it. But if, he, if you give it to him, he'll take it. And he'll build a masterpiece out of it. That's what he wants for you. So the one application for you today is to ask the question, God, how do you want to use the mess in my life towards the mission that you have for me? How do you want to use the problems that I've experienced, either that I brought upon myself or that have come from the outside? How do you want to use that for your purpose in my life? Because it sounds like you want to use all things. So don't be ashamed and don't be afraid and don't try to hide and don't give up, give it to him. Give him your stuff so he can use it for his purpose. Bow your heads with me, close your eyes if you would. I just want in each of your own hearts today for you to ask this question. God, how can you use the pain in my life for your purpose? How can you take the mess of my life and turn it into a masterpiece? 
How do I go from being just delivered to, to fulfilling the destiny that you have for me? What do you want to do with the stuff that I've got? How can you use it? Not why did I experience this pain, but how can you use this pain for your purpose? God, I pray that every single person in here today would begin to see the light at the end of that question. We begin to see how you can take every aspect of their life, every single component in their life, every single issue in their life, every single problem in our lives, God, and you can work it together towards your good. You can take our problems and, and use them to fulfill our purpose. You can take the mess and turn it into a masterpiece. God, we turn it over to you. We give you every aspect of our life today. And we ask you, Lord, to take it and use it as you would. To you be the honor, the praise, and the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.